Well, we're going to start with capital budgeting, and I'm going to give you a sort of a little introduction to what Chapter 13 is going to have, and then the video will stop. Um, the second video will be the appendix, uh, a good discussion of the time value of money. If you already have that under your belt, you know what, you can skip the next video in this series and go right to, to a, a net present value, which is the first learning objective in this chapter. So when we talk about capital budgeting, this is different from the budgeting we've already done. The budgeting, uh, the chapter on budgeting we've done is operational budgeting. It's how much do we expect to sell, what's our labor needs, what's our raw material needs, what advertising do we need to support that. That's really what we're in business to do. Capital budgeting, on the other hand, says, you know what? Uh, we should spend some more money over here or some more money over here to increase our operations or to provide better efficiency within our operations. So this becomes spending not for the sake of your operations, but to do something about your operations. So it's spending for spending, if you can follow that through. So what does it mean? Well, think of any project that requires you to spend money now and down the road, there'll be some future cash flows. That's capital budgeting. You're not really paying for uh, uh, wages or salaries or raw materials or anything here uh, that is part of current cash flow. You're making an investment in something today in the hopes that there'll be some increased future cash flow later on. Now, that future cash flow can come in two forms, either increased revenues or decreased costs. Most people look at decreased costs and say, but that's not a cash flow. But yes, it is. It's the reverse of a negative cash flow. Listen, if I can uh, make a deal with my landlord and get my rent down from $2,000 a month to $1,700 a month, I've just come up with 300 bucks a month. That's a positive cash flow for me because my negative cash flow went from negative 2,000 to negative 1,700. So the decrease in costs are just as valuable as the increase in revenues. That encompasses capital budgeting. So what are the types of things, uh, are the types of decisions that are made with capital budgeting? Well, cost reduction. We can think of uh, uh, oil exploration today. And uh, we can have a look at uh, either the shale plays in the U.S. or the tar sands in Canada. A lot of the companies in these regions are now net present value negative when they're looking at investing in new wells because the price of oil is under $50. So a lot of their capital budgeting decisions are now centered around, hey, we got to get our costs down on our current wells because the price of oil isn't there to build a new well. We can get this oil out of the ground, but let's try to get our costs down by five or 10 or $15 a barrel at this point. So they're looking at a lot of cost reduction. Typically cost reduction means automation. Uh, automation leads to higher productivity. And remember, higher productivity is lower cost per unit. So I don't have to decrease my costs. All I have to do is increase my output per hour and my cost per unit drops. That's the same thing. If my cost per unit drops, my cost of goods sold drops, my gross margin increases. You have to be able to see this all the way through, uh, the, ba through the balance sheet and into the income statement, right? So cost reduction. Uh, this is efficiency investing. Expansion to increase capacity. You can call this effectiveness investing. You get to a, a certain size, you're successful, things are going great, you got a lot of customers, let's build bigger. So you might not get, uh, you might not worry too much about your efficiency when you have unserved customers, you're going to invest in more effectiveness. How can I be more effective? I can expand. Uh, so expansion to increase your capacity. Equipment selection just between choosing two different options. Uh, should I get line A or line B? And you do it yourself. Believe it or not, you do it yourself. You think to yourself, should I get printer A uh, or should I buy printer B? And you look at printer A and printer A is $69 and printer B is $349. And it's a lure, right? You look at printer A, the naive person who doesn't uh, get involved in determining what the value of each option is, is, well, 69 bucks, I'll take that one, and forget the 349. But you find that uh, your ink cartridge replacements here are $99 every time you replace them, 
and they only last for maybe 2,500 sheets, whereas this one here is $79 to replace, and it lasts for 5,000 sheets, so that your running costs are lower. That's all part of capital budgeting is, do I take this product or do I take this product? And you look at the initial outlay and all of the initial outlays that come with it, because when you're buying some equipment, there's the initial cost, but then there's the maintenance or the carrying cost with it. Well, that's all just a stream of negative cash flows. We can still find a net present value for all the negative cash flows. You'll find, by the way, that if you buy the more expensive printer in real life, you will have a much lower net present value on the negative cash flows. It is the superior option. Lower running costs. Lease or buy. Should we lease the, uh, a vehicle or should we buy a vehicle? Should we lease an, air, uh, an airplane or should we buy the airplane? Should we lease a ship or a locomotive or should we just buy it? That's a big decision. Equipment replacement. We have this piece of equipment right now. It seems to be doing a good job, but if we bought a new one, it might do a better job. So I had an old uh, Mac, maybe about four years old, and I was using Final Cut Pro, which renders video. And it was taking a long time to render video. So I bought a new Mac, it was almost 3,000 bucks, and it renders video almost five times faster. So it clears up a lot of time for me to be more productive. So I look at that saying, well, the replacement in the time that it saves, you have to make these analysis. Should we replace the equipment? You have a 10-year-old car. Should you keep that car and face the, 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 the reality, the real reality that every year you're going to spend eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars in repairs on that thing? Or should you just get a new vehicle where the warranty is covered and you don't have those unknown repairs? You have to make that decision. So capital budgeting um, or corporate finance really or selecting projects really is a two-part uh, process. There's the screening process and there's the preferences process. And in the middle, there's a big brick wall called the hurdle return on investment, which means a product has to provide a certain minimum return on investment, otherwise don't do it. So think of it this way. If you can buy a government bond that pays 6% interest, why would you ever buy anything else that pays less? That now becomes the hurdle rate that if you're going to invest in anything, you can always get 6% with a government bond and it's safe, why would I ever buy anything that only offered 3%, right? So it's the same with projects that you invest in in a corporation. They might say, look, our hurdle rate is 20% or whatever the case is. We'll find later on that the hurdle rate is actually the weighted average cost of capital, just a peek ahead. So let's say we, we evaluate uh, project A, which we're going to learn how to do, and we find that no, it does not. We evaluate project B, and we find no, that it does not. We evaluate Project C, and we find, yes, it does. It makes it to the other side of the wall. Project D, yes, it does. Makes it to the other side of the wall, but E doesn't. Well, there we go. Screening, the screening process out of these five eliminated three right away. So we're not going to do them. They don't even enter into the capital budgeting decision at this point. There's only C and D. Now, for preferences, what this means is that, look, we, we work with constraints. Everybody works with constraints. We only have so much money to invest. Uh, we can either pick one or the other, but we don't have enough funds for both. So you may decide that, well, that's a go, and this one is a no-go. And that's when you make your decisions later on. Based on, if you watch the uh, 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 next video on, on uh, net pres or, sorry, present value, uh, you'll see the three laws of cash flow your preferences for which project you take really relate to those three laws of cash flow. So let's have a look at that one and then we'll come back to this chapter and we'll start with net present value of projects which is long, it's detailed, it, it'll take you some time to get through but I'm gonna go through it as if you had never seen this stuff before, nice and slow and easy.